thanks for the introduction, Kim. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today. So the title today is uh, Towards uh, Economic and the Fast Method for Detecting uh, Mectoxin in Feeds and Feed Ingredients. So first of all, I want to talk about the, what are the mectoxins. So mectoxins are the secondary uh, metabolites uh, with a low molecular weight that are produced in the moth. And that's not more than 250 uh, different uh, mold, uh, uh, mold toxin have been identified. So, so, so far there are three main mold uh, groups are of concern. First one is the fulizum and the produce xenolone and the human nuisance and the dawn. And also dawn also call the warming toxin uh, and, the, and also uh, call the uh, dioxin xenolone. And also T2 toxin. So the second group is uh, aspergillus. This uh, uh, fungi produces uh, aflatoxin and also ocreate toxin. And the, the, the third group is uh, penicillium that can produce aflatoxin and also ocreatoxin. So the most common mectoxin found in the feed sample, there's mainly the seven types of the mectoxin uh, that are contaminated in the feed and feed ingredients. The first one is the aflatoxins, and the, the second one is the ocreatoxin and the formamucin and the dioxin, lelovel, and T2 toxin, and xenolenol and organ as well. So the common commodity that uh, products uh, found in the feed uh, uh, containment with the mectoxin are used in, in the animal feeds. So it's mainly like a corn and the uh, wheat and barley. This is mainly the grain used in Canada and the U.S. And the rice. Rice is mainly used in the Southeast Asia and Asia territory. And also, uh, oats, sorry, oats as well. This can be used usually as the piglet feed and it has quite a high palatability. And also uh, uh, nuts and the milk. Nuts mainly used to paste food. And the milk and cheese byproduct and peanut. And also cotton seed meal they use in the, in the luminance and also sometimes the poultry feed. And also distiller dry the grain with the soluble, the DDGS that come from the ethanol plant. is a byproduct from the uh, ethanol plants. So this is the common uh, the commodities of the ingredients that uh, are contaminated with the mectoxin. And then we'll talk about the, what's the fact of affecting the mectoxin occurrence in the f food chain. The first part is the biological factor. For example, like uh, 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 some crop is easy to get infected with the fungi, some, some crop variety may be resistant to the infection. So this uh, effect can affect the mectoxin contamination as well. And also the, the toxigenic fungi is uh, infection, like uh, I mentioned, the three group, and uh, 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 mainly produce the uh, mactoxin that you just find in the feed sample. And then also environmental factors, for example, like uh, temperatures. And uh, you know, temperature sometimes a hot, uh, a high temperature, or low temperature, maybe cause different uh, uh, mactoxin contamination. For, for example, it's a hot territory that may easy to get the aflatoxin contamination. But for the cold weather, like Canada, usually aflatoxin is not, it's not a big deal as other countries like Southeast Asia. And moisture, for, for sure, also can affect the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, mectoxin occurrence. And mechanical in injury, and also for the, the damage to the seed or the grains, also can easily get the contaminated with the mectoxin. So, and the insect, the blood damage, and the, and also stress condition, for example, like stream hot, stream cold uh, weather can also uh, 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 facilitate the mectoxin contamination. And also the flooding, like that now happened in the U.S., so they can maybe also cause the, some uh, mectoxin contamination or in the grain storage. So this uh, some factor uh, in the affect uh, the mectoxin occurrences. And also other ways of harvesting, for example, like crop maturity. For example, you don't want the whole crop uh, sitting in the, uh, the, the field of complete uh, maturity for a long time. And also harvest technology also maybe can affect the mectoxin occurrences. 
And then the, during the storage as well, the temperature and the moisture and also uh, the temperature usually if you more less than that, such percentage of the, the moisture content so can, uh, can reduce the mycotoxin uh, produced in the, during the storage. And, they, and, and also the order of the grain can use the feed and the feed ingredients, right? So this part actually the my research area, I just want to really check the, how the mycotoxin affected the feed utilization efficiency and how to mitigate the adverse the effect of uh, mycotoxin contamination in the feed and the feed ingredient. So later on we are focused on feed the feed ingredient today. Of course, this mycotoxin contamination can slow the animal product, maybe can be a, affect the human health, right? So it's, uh, uh, just to give you the, the, a brief idea how this uh, fact affected the mycotoxin occurrence in the food chain, but today we will focus the feed and the feed ingredients here. And after that, I want to share with you the, the 2018 compound feed production best species in the, in the globally. So look at the, the, the international food tonnage uh, has increased by around 3% uh, by to the 1.103 billion metric ton uh, in, in 2018. So if we divide by different species, you can see the broiled chickens has uh, the feed content about 29% uh, and lay your hands about 15%. Uh, and the peak, and then the peak is about 28% of feed production in, in, in globally. And then daily cattle, about 13%, and the, the beef cattle, 8%, and aquaculture, like uh, many in the Asia territory. So it's about 4%, and pest feed, about 3%. So this data comes from the Altec Global Feed Survey, it comes from about uh, uh, in the 2018. It's quite the high, and the, 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 the production the globally. So again, I, think I want to give you some picture about the feed production in Canada. So once you look at this slide, there are about the over 30 million metric ton annually in Canada. So this includes two parts. One part is a commercial production, about 67 percentage. And the, the on-site production is about 33 percentage. So commercial production, mainly the feed produced in the feed mill, commercial feed mill. They are sell the feed to the farm, right? So on-farm production just produce the farm on-site. So majority of the commercial product, uh, 67 percentage. This produce about total revenue of over $4 billion per year. So it's a uh, quite important economic uh, uh, in, uh, sector in Canada. And then let's the, look at the raw ingredient we used in Canada. So the for protein source are mainly like the soybean and the uh, canola. And for grain, most widely used are the corn, wheat, and the barley. So this is the most popular use in, 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 in Canada. You can see the 80% of the barley and the 60% of the corn, 30% of the wheat are used for feed. So quite a significant amount of use for, 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 for feeders. And then, you give the commercial feed mill distribution in Canada. There are about 500 feed mills in Canada. But you look at the distribution, so mainly in Quebec, 36%, and the Ontario is about 30% of the feed mill. And the 22% own plant reeds, like including Manitoba. And a land percent is Atlantic, Atlantic. And the 3% is the British, the BC province. So this, uh, according to the Canadian Feed Industry uh, Statistics uh, 2017. So maybe 2018 has some slightly change. So after that, I want to give you the, our, because talk about feed, feed ingredients, and then I want to show you the globe map of mycotoxin occurrence and the risk in different the regions. So this data comes from the Biome Mycotoxin Survey 2018. So this different color show the the, the, the lighter color just means uh, less risk as uh, a modulated risk. So the once color become uh, darker, that's um, uh, extreme risk. So once you look at this map, we can see that some territory has uh, uh, the stream, uh, has a stream risk. For example, like China and Southeast Asia, and actually in Canada, South American, uh, uh, North American, and South American also 
are there uh, some uh, risk as well. So when you look at this map, so, so the down contamination rate is quite high compared with uh, other, uh, other mycotoxins. As I mentioned in the previous slide, so temperature can affect the, the mycotoxin contamination and they maybe affect the different type of uh, mycotoxin contamination. For example, you look at the, the, here, the South, East, uh, South, South Asia, the aflatoxin contamination is uh, very high, 87%. And China is also, China and Taiwan also is very high as well, 28%. So this is because the uh, South Asia, the temperature is, is quite a warm, warm weather, right? So in China, the uh, South part that have a high uh, 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 aflatoxin contamination. The North part have less uh, aflatoxin contamination. But you look at in Canada and, and the US, the aflatoxin contamination rate is very low. It's about the eight percentage. It's quite it's, uh, uh, low. But again, so look at the, all the territories, the warming toxin down the contamination rate is very high, average more than 60 percentage. So, so from this map, you can see the mycotoxin contamination is uh, becoming the, uh, uh, a global issue, uh, a global issue now, especially in livestock uh, sectors. So we needed to find a way to, to detect the mycotoxin contamination and monitor the risk in the, for the feed and feed, the feed industry. So, and then it uh, gives some, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, news paper that was happening in Canada. This one is, I think, two years ago. This uh, mycotoxin uh, testing origin in the decided dry years uh, on Prairie. You can see the newspaper. And then and another one is uh, the news, uh, newspaper test, so a title is uh, Check That Ratio Mycotoxin Level in Ontario Corn Creeping Higher. So the last year, this uh, Canadian mycotoxin fears draw the feed and grain industry response. So this uh, uh, last year, you can see the, 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 some more than the corn. And the most recently, this, the, at the beginning of this year, you can see the Canada down contamination of corn, it's more widespread than any other year. So Canada also at the risk. It's uh, not like uh, it's very safe. And they, so we also have uh, some uh, risk here, we need to take some action to, to protect our industry. So we talk, and then, so globally, so mycotoxin contamination in the feed, in the feeding ingredient, it's a big issue now. So, and then I will show you how this uh, mycotoxin contamination affects animal health and animal production. So, this is a, uh, the table show you the relative toxicity of the different types of mycotoxin on the different level stock uh, species. So you look at the af aflatoxin, ocratoxin, T2 toxin, and the down, zeno nano, and the formalucin. So from here is that one plus, one plus that means mild toxicity, two plus that means modulated toxicity, right? And the three uh, plus mean higher toxicity. So from this table, you can see the swine and poultry quite, uh, well, uh, quite sensitive to the mycotoxin contamination in the feed. Uh, Relatively speaking, ruminant has a, a bit resistant to the uh, mycotoxin uh, contamination. But I don't want to say this uh, ruminant is uh, okay with uh, 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 mycotoxin contamination in the feed. So, relatively speaking, it's, uh, uh, poultry and swans quite sensitive to the mycotoxin contamination. Uh, and then I show you the, the negative effect of different mycotoxin in poultry and swan. So when you look at it here, the, the, the good summary. So the, the mycotoxin contamination depends on which type of mycotoxin contamination. So it can reduce mortality, re reduce the feed intake, reduce the feed efficiency, and, the, uh, and also increase the, increase the mortality, and also maybe reduce the vaccine, vaccine, uh, vaccination efficacy. The similar with the uh, uh, pig, so you can see that uh, also, the, the mycotoxin contamination in the feed can reduce the feed intake, especially like piglets. It's very sensitive to the, the, the mycotoxin contamination, especially like uh, uh, down and warm toxin. And also reduce the uh, growth uh, weight gain and reduce the conception rate because it's special for reproductive animals. So, the, so in this case, sometimes we, we avoid to feed animals with uh, uh, 
uh, with the uh, uh, feed the uh, reproductive animal with the uh, mactosin contaminated feed. So, and they are giving examples how the down and the vomit toxin affect the feed intake in the swine. So this is the first week of feeding. That means uh, after uh, 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 after weaning, one week. Right? So the feed intake is quite important for for pig to develop the gut. gut. And you can see with the increase in the dawn concentration in the feed, right? So what's the, and then the feed intake decreased linearly. So you can see it's a very, very obviously. And the, and the cat average is seven, average of 7.5 feed reduction, feed intake reduction for every one ppm of the dawn in, in, in the feed. So this, uh, you can see the how down affect uh, feed intake in swan. They come from, the data come from several publication, several publication. And, and then give you another example for in the broiler chicken. So the, how the aflatoxin affect the, uh, the growth in the broiler chickens. Look at the, look at once this solid line is the control, control that without any aflatoxin contamination. And the, 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 the dash line, that means the 1.5 ppm uh, aflatoxin contamination in the feed. So you can see this uh, uh, mactoxin contamination affected the body weight again. So especially at the low protein level. So you can see this uh, uh, huge difference. Again, you can, so let's look at the, the fit utilization efficiency, that the gain and the fit ratio is also reduced by the aflatoxin contamination in the, in, 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 in the chip. Yeah. So this again shows uh, uh, the aflatoxin can uh, affect the growth in the broiler chicks. So without this uh, adverse the negative effect of the animal health and animal production, so CFI has some regulation and also has some recommendation level for uh, mactoxin tolerance level in, in feed and feed stuff. So uh, we want to look at this table, legislate the maximum tolerance level for dawn is for the daily, for cattle or poultry is five ppm. And for the swine, the young, uh, young animal, the cat, lactating reproductive animals, it's a one ppm, no more than one ppm. And if aflatoxin for animal feed stuff, it's a 20 ppb, it's a 20 ppb, yeah. And if you want to optimize gross performance and the feed utilization efficiency, so you may, uh, 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 give more info, uh, give, want to minimize some mactoxin inclusion uh, contamination level in, uh, uh, in the feed. For example, like a uh, T2 toxin for the swine is less than that 1 ppm, and uh, xenolano is about uh, for uh, get that is 1 to 3, less than 1 to 3 ppm. For the daily cattle, maybe just a bit, uh, about no more than 10 ppm, and for sheep and pigs, 0.25 to 5 ppm. So o'clock toxin the same for the uh, swine diet. For kidney damage, you want, don't want the kidney damage, maybe have to listen to that 0.2 uh, uh, ppm. If you don't want to affect the gross performance, and this is uh, tapping here, if you, if you don't want to affect the, uh, the gross performance, like body weight, maybe less than that 2 ppm. And auger as well. Some, uh, at a very low le level, so you, so this, uh, if you want to optimize your uh, uh, animal production and uh, gross performance, so you need to follow this uh, uh, recommended level, yeah. And then I will talk about the, some of the integrated mactoxin management strategy. So when we look at the, the second slide, we have different factors of can affect the mactoxin occurrence in the food chain. But now we also take some strategy to, to avoid and to reduce or, or minimize uh, mactoxin contamination. The first part develop the crop uh, during the pre-harvesting and harvesting stage. So develop some crop variety with disease resistance and also prevent uh, contaminated grain with from uh, entering the value chain. Once this ingredient entering the, the, the food chain is difficult to to, to follow are difficult to, to monitor. And they control mactoxin, uh, produce a passage like a, the, the physonium and the penicillium. So this uh, 
control the infection, and also on-farm testing for mectoxin. So you want to make sure, that, because some, some mectoxin produce in the field, especially like a, like a vomitoxin, right? And during storage, so you, we can use some strategy to detoxify mectoxin using chemical and the biological approaches. And now we have a project with uh, uh, Dr. Sumniu and uh, Dr. Naturi, uh, Dr. Martin Naturi. And also preservative, for example, pro uh, probiotic acid, the moisture control less than 13%, and they separate the damage of seed and also store more of the grain separately. And then for, for the ethanol producer and the feed meal farms, so again, we can also detoxify the mactoxin and we'll use the chemical or biological approach. Also reduce some effect of mactoxin by binder. For example, so a lot of binder can uh, absorb the mactoxin and reduce the adverse effect uh, to the animal for some clays and the uh, yeast cell wells and other yeast uh, product. So, uh, but for, for some mactoxin, the absorption absorbing the efficiency is very high for, for example, aflatoxin. Toxin band has a, a, about 90, more than 90% uh, efficiency, so you can remove majority of aflatoxin in the diet. For some toxin like a uh, uh, vomitoxin down, the binding efficiency is very low, it's really no 20% average, so some may be at, at, at 40%, but they, so if you just use band, may not remove all the down in the diet, right? And also preservative, like a probiotic acid. The management skills, for example, if you already find the mactoxin contaminated in the feed, so try not, try not to feed this to the, more, uh, to the more sensitive animal, like a young animal, like a reproductive animals. So this is some management strategy. And the dilution is also is a partial solution as well. So you, you know that what's the, the, the mactoxin concentration in the feed ingredient, and then you may not, you can, and then you can formulate the diet try to uh, uh, avoid the, the mactosin contamination more than one ppm or two ppm or, uh, uh, or more than the regulated levels. And the nutritional strategy, for example, dietary spray dry plasma protein, this is mainly for young piglets because, uh, for example, vomitoxin can reduce feed intake. Reduce feed intake. So, but this one, protein, dry, dry plasma protein is a very palatable protein, can increase the palatability of the feed, uh, 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 feed. So this can increase the feed intake. For some point, they can minimize the, 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 the mitigate the adverse effect of the uh, warm toxin contamination in the feed. And the feed processing, like this can be washing, dehurling, from, uh, for washing because most uh, toxins are water soluble. And the dehurling maybe the the mucosal many the the surface the grains and the seeds so this can also reduce uh, the contamination of the uh, feed ingredients uh, uh contamination and also fermentation sometimes can detoxify or de uh, transfer the mucosal to another form with with, with uh, less toxic uh, effect so anyway so th this is all about the strategy we can reduce the the, the uh, mactoxin, the risk in the, uh, in the feed industry. But all we, if we want to do all this, we need to know what's the, which mactoxin are in the ingredient and what's level. So, so, the, so for the accurate monitoring and risk assessment of the mactoxin contamination, and the, there are better tools to help minimize the impact on animal product. So that's the reason why we, we think about the, 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 the Analysis is very important. The mactoxin analysis is very important. So this is the importance of mactoxin an analysis. The first one, because it can help you to meet the regulatory guidelines. For example, international trade, because different countries have different the regulation about the, uh, the mactoxin contamination. And also to reduce the risk of mactoxin contamination in the feed. For example, if you already know what the, the, the uh, mactoxin concentration in the feed ingredient, so you can change, you can change your formulation, try to minimize the level of the mactoxin in the feed, especially for the young animal feed. And to maintain product quality, this is especially for the ethanol plant, for example, they are very sensitive to the, the, the mactoxin contamination because the first reason, 
because the, the, when you produce the isonon after that is the byproduct DDGS, you will concentrate the mycotoxin concentration two to three times. So, and then, of course, the, the DDGS has a very high mycotoxin contamination level. And secondary, because the mycotoxin can also affect the yeast fermentation, so can the, and reduce the isonon production efficiency. So it is just an example. And it's also determine optimal the feeding strategy. For example, if you know what the, uh, the, 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 the which, which mycotoxin are, are, are in the feed and at what level, so you may use some other strategy like a binder, toxin binder, or you can use some detoxified uh, probiotics. So if uh, no mycotoxin in your feed, so you don't have to include the toxin binder and or other agents as well because it's a waste of money. And for feed industry, the, the margin is very small, usually one to three percentage. So you try to use the uh, maximum use uh, the investment. And also to accurately monitor mycotoxin contamination. And so you, all the stage, is, uh, you need to know the, 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 the contamination and then the low beta and then take this uh, action to reduce the uh, risk. So all these have to, you need to know what's the mycotoxin level in the feed ingredient and the feeds, right? So that now most the popular the detection method uh, uh, include two types. One is a conventional method, many of them laboratory method. For example, like ELISA, and then link it the uh, immunosorbent assay. And also the second one, the sign layer uh, chromatography, TLC and HPLC and the LCMS and this liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So the, all this phase is very, is very accurate and also takes a lot of time, probably it takes a lot of time and quite expensive, hand spacing. So some also fast method like uh, lateral flow strip technology. This actually is quite popular in the feed industry. It's quite a standard setup for feed mill. They have, they use this uh, lateral flow uh, 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 strip technology to detect the vomitoxin, uh, especially uh, like down in the feed, feeding me on site. So another method like uh, optimal based method, optimal is the DNA uh, sequence, the kind of bindings, can kind of bind with some toxin uh, specifically, is the DNA sequence. So let's now, some people use this for to detect the uh, mycotoxin and this, some people also use this optimal to add binder uh, to, to remove the mycotoxin because it's more specific. Yeah, because the toxic binder is uh, not very specific. So optimal, you can design the DNA sequence to bind the, uh, the mycotoxin uh, specifically. So what's the challenge now? So the, the first challenge is difficult to obtain the sample which is a presentative of the entire rock and the lot or truck. So because uh, the truck is, is huge, it's really like 20 ton or uh, 20 metric ton. So how do you get a sample? This really can represent the, the mycotoxin contamination in, in this whole truck and the uh, entire lot. This is a very challenging, very challenging. The second one is also quite similar with this, the first one, the heterogeneous uh, distribution of mycotoxin in the feed ingredients. So, that's not equal, equally distributed in the, the ingredient. So if you want more accurate information, you have to increase the size of the sample, increase the number of the sample samples, and then to analyze them, and then of course, they will increase the cost, increase the cost uh, dramatically. And the other one is a laboratory-based method, that is ELISA and the HPLC and the GC, oh no, uh, uh, LCMS, and they, they were very costly, very expensively, and takes time as well. In some cases, the complex equipment are needed. So for example, just uh, Canadian Grand Commission currently charges $50, for, uh, $50 per sample for, for ELISA, and the $100, $195 for the HPLC test. So it's quite uh, very expensive. So if you want to get more accurate information from the, your feed ingredients, so you have to take more sample, increase the size of sample, so and, and, then, and then increase the uh, detection cost. Because for feed meal, feed, in, feed industry, it's commodity group. So the, the, the margin is very, it's quite low. Usually the 
in Canada, one, two, three percentage of uh, lead profit in the, in the feed mill. So if you uh, spend too much money for detection, that's it's not uh, affordable. And the currently testing at the feed mill are down a few pocket for each truck lot. It's similar with the app. And the latent flow strip technology, and uh, take about uh, eight to 13 minutes, eight minutes to 13 minutes, depends on the, uh, from sampling to, uh, to the result, it's about the eight to 13 minutes. But this is still too long and expensive for, for, for the feeding mill. So why? Because once uh, the, the, the truck delivers the corn or wheat into the feeding mill, so they need to get the result first, and then load all the ingredients to the feeding mill. So that means the truck have to st stop there for, for uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes is short, but for, for, for them, that's quite long, quite long for their production efficiency. So this is still too long and expensive. And also, uh, the last one is the uh, musket and the mactoxin are not detectable by current method. So this is quite a challenge as well, because the plants also can modify the mactoxin to protect the, the, themselves. So the, the modified the mactoxin are not detectable by current method. So it, uh, this is also a challenge. But that also, this uh, musket mactoxin may be even more toxic to the animals or less toxic to animal, depends, uh, depends on how they are modified the mactoxins. So the, the question right now is, uh, so can we develop a quick, easy test that is imp uh, because, because of the challenge is uh, uh, inexpensive, uh, accurate, faster, and more representative. So I just I want to give this question to my, my, my colleague, uh, uh, Francis. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'd like to uh, first thank the faculty for the invitation and the opportunity to, uh, to speak about this uh, very interesting collaboration, also very nice introduction uh, at the beginning. Uh, I'd like to uh, kind of attach my second part to this nice uh, first part by, by Cheng Bo that really helped me to uh, put what I'm going to present uh, in an interesting context. Uh, I also just want to mention uh, uh, I have been uh, associated with the Department of Biosystem Engineering for the past 10 years or so. That hopefully makes me not a stranger to the faculty. Uh, all right, so uh, how do we address some of the challenges that Dr. Yang mentioned? Uh, I want to first give my uh, acknowledgement to all the people contributed to uh, the work. Uh, we definitely learned a lot from uh, Cheng Bo's group uh, really, the people in both lab uh, did the work, uh, particularly uh, Qian from uh, Cheng Bo's group and Jian Dong uh, in my lab. I'd uh, like to thank for their excellent uh, effort. And another reason we uh, selfishly invited them to be here today is that they can help us answer questions if it's needed. And uh, Mei Li, uh, who is a former member of my lab, Develop a paper based uh, micro 4D device uh, some time ago, which really provides the basis for the uh, toxin detection chip that we are uh, developing now. Uh, another special person I want to thank is, oh, sorry, is uh, Professor Sun Liu from uh, Biosystem Engineering. Uh, Dr. Liu is a collaborator of Cheng Bo and also a collaborator of mine. Uh, it's really him introduce us uh, on uh, this uh, interesting uh, collaboration. And then finally, uh, I'd like to thank the University uh, Collaborative Research Project Grant to provide seed funding. Uh, in the past uh, few months, there have been some uh, busy traffic between the north of the campus, which is uh, my lab, it's based to Chengbo's lab, which is located in the wire south uh, of the university. And there are always the university center in between where we compromise the distance, where we talk about the collaboration or coffees. Okay, so our strategy to address the challenge on mycotoxin detection is to use uh, microfluidic devices, or sometimes people call this lab on a chip approach. Uh, basically, uh, those devices, uh, we can fabricate very small channels 
uh, structures on a miniaturized uh, a device that we can control the environment that we can do interesting experiment that has much relevance to uh, bioanalytical analysis, uh, biology, and many other uh, life science related research. And this is one way uh, that we make our device by photolithography and soft lithography where we can fabricate the device in polymers. Uh, you can also make the device in thermal plastic or even just cut the channel into adhesive uh, plastics. So this is really just using a very inexpensive uh, uh, cutter uh, to cut the device into the plastic. Uh, recently, uh, 3D printing has become quite popular and uh, many people are using uh, 3D printers to uh, fabricate the micro devices as well. One particular the relevant uh, way to make the device is to actually using a filter paper. Uh, you can actually print the channel onto a paper to define the uh, channel boundaries and then you use that as a device to do your experiment. And then there is a trend in the last few years to combine different micro devices with smartphones for different mobile sensing applications. Okay, so in the past 20 years or so, uh, this lab on a chip approach has been really extending into many uh, life science uh, research. Uh, I speak to some of our own work, which basically using uh, micro devices to study the motion of different biological cells. So this is a typical setup of my lab to uh, visualize uh, the motion of different cells in a microchip using uh, time-lapse microscopy. So here we have the neutrophils from human blood, uh, breast cancer cells, and here is the adipose stem cells from red. We can control the chemical environment. In this particular case, we are looking at chemotaxis. That is, we have a, a chemical concentration gradient uh, and when we look at how the cell respond to different chemical stimulations. But for those kind of applications, you can see, even though we are doing lab on a chip, but really we need this chip to be operated in a, a specialized facility. So really some people argue this is a chip in a lab, right? We need uh, the microscope set up, uh, we need the computers, uh, often time we need pumps to deliver the solutions. But when we come to diagnostic applications or detection applications, the lab on a chip approach itself become much more important. I'll give you a, a few examples from our uh, recent work. Uh, one is to uh, use a polymer device to detect uh, albumin concentration in human urine samples for chronic kidney disease diagnosis. So those devices are fabricated in uh, polymer. Now we have a throughput of 16. We can do 16 experiments in parallel on a single device. And then here are the channels. We can control the mixing ratios of the dyes and the urine samples depending on the length, relative length of the channels. Then we further cover the input with the oil to balance the pressures between different inlets. So everything become uh, self-content. It's operated in a standalone manner without requiring uh, external pressure pumps. And with this, we can uh, detect the urine albumin concentration. We call this the uh, UAL chip. Uh, we got a fairly nice uh, uh, linear curve, which we can use to determine the concentration of albumin from unknown samples. Uh, we compare this with a traditional uh, well-placed based method, and you can see one of the feature of using the micro device is we can get fairly stable measurement because the continuous laminar flow mixing in the devices, as opposed to this time-dependent uh, signal on a well-based method. Uh, we compare our measurement with the uh, clinical data of, uh, measured from the patient, we got fairly good correlation. So that's one example of using this lab on a chip approach for uh, diagnostic application. 
The second example, which is much more related to the uh, toxin detection device that we're developing here, is we develop a CRP chip to measure the C-reactive protein concentration in the patient's uh, blood samples. Again, this is from the chronic kidney disease patients. And the device here is fabricated out of a filter paper. Uh, what we do is we print the channel onto the filter paper. The wax uh, ink will define the hydrophobic boundaries, so you have the channel on the device. And then we attach different pads uh, to the device to assemble uh, the CRP chip so we can make the measurement. The filter paper is self-powered, so again, you don't need uh, external pump to drive the solution in. We deposit the antibodies onto the device, then we flow in the samples. The antibody is conjugated with the gold nanoparticles. Uh, so after it's detecting the CRP in the patient samples, they can be further captured by the antibody in the detecting point of the device. They can compare with this and the control point. And finally, we fabricated a holder using 3D printing to attach the paper device to the camera of a smartphone. Then we have an app to automatically capture the image of your signal, then carry it back to the concentration of CRP. So this is just the uh, uh, 3D printed holders for this CRP uh, device. Uh, then again, we have the comparison between our environment using the paper device and uh, the conventional ELISA kit uh, measurement, and we got a fairly uh, good correlation as well. Uh, CRP is not a specific biomarker for CKD, but at least from this set of experiments, we can distinguish the patient in a more advanced stage of the disease compared to the earlier stage. So the CRP chip really address some of the issues in diagnosis, including the cost factor. Uh, complexity of the uh, operation, and furthermore, the throughput, because you can basically print as many as test units in the paper using this method. And that's why this is really gives us the motivation to develop this toxin device using similar strategy. So I want to mention we are uh, kind of interested in uh, uh, applications of uh, microfluidic device in agriculture and biosystem from many years ago. We have a review paper published in 2011 in Lab on Chip to look at the development at the time uh, for the relevant applications in food, agriculture, and the biosystem industry. Uh, even eight years ago, there are already many development of the device in food safety, food processing, animal science, plant production, and even biofuel production. And for animal science-related applications at the time, there are already a few devices are targeting uh, toxin detection. But we really didn't do anything uh, after we wrote this review paper. We did uh, have a small uh, project to look at the effect of C. defacial toxin on immune cell functions. Uh, we found uh, the defacial toxin can uh, uh, affect the migration or the motility of human immune uh, lymphocytes. And furthermore, the toxin can also uh, affect the integrity of the incidental epithelium cells. But not until recently, we start to look at the potential of uh, microfluid devices on toxin applications again. Uh, right before our application started, we just worked with the biosafety device to get rid of all the toxin samples from the past collaboration so we can downgrade our biosafety level. And at the moment we uh, downgraded it, this collaboration started. So we're ready to come back to the toxin applications. Okay, so much of this has already been nicely presented by Cheng Bo to compare different uh, exin uh, strategies for mycotoxin detection, ELISA, HPLC, uh, LC, mass spec, and then the, uh, the later flow immunoassays, which is more suitable for on-site detection. And definitely if you look at the 
LFIA uh, is already at a low cost. It has relatively high speed. And this is the only one compared to other methods that is, can be used for on-site uh, analysis. And this provides another motivation for us to develop a uh, later flow-based assay, but in a microfluidic context. Okay, uh, there are other ways uh, using uh, microfluid devices for microtoxin detection. Uh, just a few quick examples here uh, coming from more recent uh, development. One is using a protein microarray to simultaneously detect four different microtoxins. And the other one here is actually using a optimal based detection method that Cheng Bo mentioned toward the end of his presentation. Using a volumetric bar chart uh, to determine the level of the microtoxin concentrations. But for those experiments uh, that I mentioned here, you see the one here still require external pumps. So you, you need much larger external facilities to assist the experiment. And here for the optimal based environment, the requirement for the uh, reagent is much higher. So our idea is uh, we definitely want the accuracy, right, that can be actually determine the microtoxin concentration. But beyond that, we really want to push the limit of the cost factor, the speed, and more importantly, we want to make sure our device is portable that can be later used on site. So based on this, uh, we adapted this uh, paper-based microfluid device for uh, microtoxin detection. And as a primary target, we uh, developed this uh, method to detect vomit toxin water down for the reason that Cheng Bo has nicely uh, explained. So what we have here is we have a device printed into filter paper. But instead of using a sandwich-based immunoassay, which you have to worry about this uh, uh, reaction of the whole complex, we want to make things simpler. So this is a modified uh, 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 strategy compared to the CRP chip that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we call this a competing assay. The idea is we will mix the uh, toxin samples with the called nanoparticle conjugated uh, detecting antibodies. Then we'll also mix the samples into the device. Higher the concentration of the toxin in your sample, uh, less the antibody will be available in your mixture. So when the mixture flow into the detecting point, uh, we have a standard toxin here waiting, again, to react with the uh, toxin antibodies. But as you can imagine, the detection signal here largely depending on the toxin concentrations in your sample. So in a sense, higher the concentration of your sample, lower the signal you will see in the detecting point. And here we have the uh, control point for comparison. So instead of doing the addition to have a higher detection signal proportional to the toxin concentration in your sample, here we are doing the subtraction. Right. Okay, so uh, talk a little bit more of the details of the device fabrication and operation. We have a wax printer to print the channels onto a filter paper. Here we have a square shape. All the dark colors are the region with the wax ink. So those are the hydrophobic barrier. The solution is not penetrating into the wax printed region. The white region are the blank filter paper, which will allow the solution to go in. We can do duplicate, uh, du duplex to have two samples uh, detected at the same time. Uh, we do a brief heating to make sure the wax ink is penetrating into the paper, so it's blocking all the solutions uh, from the hydrophilic region into the hydrophobic region. Uh, then we put in the uh, toxin standard as a test point, and then the uh, secondary antibodies as the control point. For the operation, uh, after this is uh, fabricated, we will flow the device with uh, BSA to block 
any non-specific binding site. Uh, that will allow this uh, mixture of the uh, toxin sample and uh, the gold nanoparticle conjugate antibodies into the device for this competing reaction. Uh, the signal will show uh, the color which can be detected by uh, uh, a portable microscope that we fabricated in our lab. So this is fairly small, like this big. You can move back and forth between my lab in the Allen building and uh, Chongbo's lab in animal science. So that's kind of the flow chart for both the device fabrication and the operation. Uh, I want to show you a, a quick movie uh, to uh, go over this process again. It's fairly quick. We call this the down chip in action in this next nice April of Winnipeg. So we're designing the device in the computer. It's printed by the wax printer. Now we'll briefly heat uh, to light the ink into the filter paper. Uh, we are loading the toxin samples and then the control point as well. And the middle part is to help separate the two sample points. Then we allow the BSA to block the non-specific uh, bending sites. And then the mixture of toxin sample and the antibody is added. They flow into the device being detected. And sometimes you need to uh, use the absorption pad to uh, give a little bit of power to drive the flow in. And this is a portable imaging system. The signal is captured. Then we can uh, calibrate the signal uh, with the uh, color and we determine the mycotoxin concentration. Uh, and we're probably running a little bit out of time, but it's basically show you the idea. I want to quickly show you some of the preliminary results from the first side of the experiment. Uh, this is the direction of the flow. And then this is the concentration of the uh, toxins uh, in the increasing direction from the left to the right, all the way from the plant control sample to 50 nanogram per mile. As you can see, as you're increasing the toxin concentration, the intensity of the test point become lower and lower. And this is translate to gray intensity. Then we can calibrate the down concentration with the signal intensity. Then we extract the linear range uh, of, as our calibration curve. So if you have an unknown sample, it can be fed back to this uh, uh, linear curve to determine the down concentration. Now, really, this is the very first uh, trial of the experiment. Uh, there are lots of things can be further optimized. But based on this, we can already think about some uh, uh, competitive comparison with the other existing uh, method. As we can see, the uh, detection limit is already pretty good. And this is actually the lowest concentration that we can detect that actually shows the uh, a clear change of the signal color. Uh, time is comparable to commercial strip. Linear range is fairly narrow compared to commercial strip and the HPLC, but the cost is already much lower. Uh, I think this is probably not updated. Uh, Chengbo mentioned for HPLC, they can be as high as $195 per sample. And for commercial street, usually it costs six to seven dollars per test. And here we can lower that to about two to three dollars for each sample. And definitely it's very small, so you can do this on the site. All right, so quickly to wrap up, uh, there's much more to do. Uh, we're working on to further improve the sensitivity of the down chip. Uh, once this is done, we can move on to detect multiple mycotoxins on a similar device in a high throughput format. And in the last coffee meeting, we have already started discussing if we can further detect uh, mycotoxins in some real feed samples uh, in addition to the standard samples. And then to make it more portable, we can apply this uh, smartphone-based 
uh, readers to assist the on-site detection. Uh, so with that, I think we're probably stopping here. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much again for listening. Yeah, so, so definitely uh, for solid samples, there's a separate uh, extraction procedure before we can run the, uh, the chip uh, in the liquid phase. Uh, and when you do, is that a cross-reactivity or is it purely sensitive to only one uh, type of mycotoxin? Or do we have to be concerned that other mycotoxins uh, would also interact. Right, that, that's a very, very good question. We have already thinking about maybe adding uh, other type of toxins uh, to look at if there are any cross re reactions with our device, right? Any, any noise uh, yes. uh, that will affect our analysis. Yeah, just to add up, um, the, we also check the pH value, the pH, uh, give the pH value also affect the detection result and also probably the mineral concentration in the solution or in the sample may also affect the, uh, the detection as well. So we will do that with this test in the future uh, to see how it will affect the results. That's much for So I'm from West, uh, West Africa, and I know we have issues of uh, mycotoxins a lot because of the climate. It's very hot in yeah. South Carolina. So I was really surprised to see the, the graph when we showed the, and there was nothing around West Africa, no occurrence, the uh, risk of occurrence of mycotoxin uh, contamination around the area of West Africa. Yeah, yeah pretty much the whole of Africa. I saw just some few patches. Yeah, it's a good question. That means the gray color doesn't that mean that no uh, mycotoxin contamination risk there. I think there's no data from that area. That's mean we don't have data. Oh no, the data don't have data for that. Yeah. My, sorry, my other question was to do with the processing as part of the integrated management uh, mm -hmm. strategies. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you could wash, ferment, dissolve, and I'm wondering these are toxins and. For aflatoxin, I know they are heat stable, they are not degraded by heat. So I'm just wondering how processing can actually degrade these toxins in the feed. Like, say, for fish pellets, mm -hmm. um, how do you do that? Yeah, the process method, you may, because of most of the mycotoxin contamination in the surface area of the sea, right? So if you be airing, that can remove the, the, the mycotoxin contamination. Separate the degrading and also the, the mineral part for, for feeding green. I'm not sure that. Well, I, I just also, I'm just more, more particular about the uh, processing process. Because I know there's I think lactose is quite stable. It is uh, the heat uh, or temperature, quite very stable. Yeah. So the heat process may not uh, detoxify the lactose. This is one more question. Yeah. For the device, you need to be aware of antibiotic antibody. Your technology also uses antibody, right? So then, basically, we know my task is more than 200 species, and these different groups have different chemical functions. So how you solve this problem? Uh, <coughs> so I guess comparing to ELISA, we're basically, here we're looking at one reaction, right? Basically, the measurement based on a single reaction between 
the antibody and the toxin, right? Uh, but then there's a competition between the antibody with the, the toxin in the target samples and the reaction between the antibody and uh, the uh, toxin we put on the chip, right? Depending on how they, uh, how they compete with each other, we can get different signals. Uh, whereas in ELISA, you have to worry about the, the bending between the target with uh, the capture and the detecting antibodies, right? So that's where the part we simplified our process. So basically, for your technique, you also develop different kind of antibody for different kind of mitosis. Do we need to do that? Well, right now, all the antibodies are uh, bought from commercial sources. Oh, I right? see. Yeah. But in terms of the cost, right? So right now, it's a pilot study. Is uh, even though it's already lowered the cost to two to three dollars per, per test, I think it's still fairly expensive because you know all the uh, uh, reagents were bought with small amount, right? So the price is high, and the China designs is is just a, a preliminary uh, 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 idea that we put into this study. There's a definitely room to uh, to further op optimize the the China designs in the chip, right? And this can be done. Uh, fairly quick because it's basically just you modify the design of the computer and print another device into the future paper. And with that, we think there are potential to further lower uh, the cost for each each test. And there's really, I think there's no limit to increase the, uh, the, the throughput, right? You can put many, many parallel channels on the same, same device as opposed to uh, other methods that we are comparing to. Thank you so much for sharing your translational research. It's, it's fascinating. So my question is that, because you showed the 30 studies, the two studies is clinical studies. So you measured, your, your, your paper-based assay can measure albumin in patients with CKD uh, right. in, in their urine, as well as in the plasma, the C-reactive protein. Right. So uh, I'm just curious about, uh, you compare to the, like the conventional uh, LASA assay, uh, the kit costs about $800. Right. So, uh, so your essay is much cheaper than ELASA essay? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so like, like you roughly mentioned, the ELASA kit typically costs a couple hundred dollars. And uh, 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 sometimes they cannot be done. Uh, the clinical right away have to send out to a special laboratory uh, for the testing. Uh, so that takes time as well. And for this one, because of the detector itself is just a smartphone with a holder to attach the device to the smartphone camera. So it really can be done on site. And price wise, for the C reactive protein detection chip, because it's on paper, when we calculate all the cost of the reagent, uh, they go down to about 50 cents per chip. Okay. So right. it, is your mass commercially available? Oh, well, we have, we have uh, uh, for some of the uh, uh, CKD. Uh, diagnosis chip we develop, we have some patent applications uh, uh, filed with the uh, tech transfer office, but I guess it takes time to uh, really go down the commercialization pathway to make available, uh, you know, to the end users. Thank you. Right. So maybe just in the interest of time, we'll draw the questions to a close, and I'm sure both speakers are willing to stay around for a few minutes longer sure. to yeah. respond to any additional questions. Okay. So please join me once again in thanking our two guest speakers for an excellent